So do you guys remember the, the old saying, sticks and stones may break your bones, or my bones, but words will never hurt me? Right? You guys, I, I remember that when I was a kid. Um, I guess the idea of that is that it's to make you tougher, right? To give you resilience, that, that you know, that you won't be hurt by the bullying names or things that people might call you. But when we think of it, it's kind of bogus because, you know, I've broken various bones or had injuries uh, throughout my life, and they've healed up. I might have some scars here and there, but some of the words that have been said harshly, you know, to me, they stick with you. And I think that we can all probably, you know, think about times when someone has, you know, said a harsh word to us. And it's usually not just once, but it's again and again and again. And, and it can have a devastating impact on us, on our self-esteem, on our sense of self, you know, on how we think about ourselves. And how even, you know, even just hearing again and again someone slander or use prejudicial terms against other people, that can impact how we see other people as well. So I think that, that sticks and stones, sure, they can break your bones and those can heal. But words do hurt. Words can hurt. And they can sort of stick with us for much longer than any of us can realize. And it's not just harsh words that can harm us. But I think it's also the slippery half-truths that we can use, the misinformation, how we can use language to sort of, you know, cloud matters, how we can gaslight people, and, and all of those things, that that is something which, you know, we're getting far too accustomed to that in advertising, right? The whole advertising is, is meant to sort of think you need someone or need something um, that maybe you really don't need. And it's sort of promoting stuff that maybe, you know, is, is better than it truly is. So truth in advertising is important. But I think it's even worse now where in, in news, you know, throughout the internet, you know, in politics, that... It's a sad thing that you have to be on guard and you have to evaluate, you know, everything that you read. Now, James is very much concerned with the tongue, right? We've seen um, already in the book of James a, a whole series of, of times where he's talked about the importance of what we say, what we claim, you know, so for instance, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, that, you know, asking God for wisdom, but asking without wavering, right? Having that sort of integrity, even when we, when we come to God in prayer. He's talked about, you know, and he's corrected inaccurate theological language when, when we sort of say that one's temptations are from God. He, of course, the, the verse that Stephanie preached on, and that is so memorable, is that everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And, and even in that verse, notice a connection between language and anger, that there is this connection between, you know, those two things. Um, and then, of course, um, in, in James 1, verse 26, James equates the ability to control your tongue as a sign of true religion. I'm not quite sure if that's what I would have said as, you know, as, as the sort of the default, the, the lowest common denominator or what it means to, to follow Christ. 
You know, but he says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. Their religion is worthless. And he continues, and he cascades those who, uh, greetings that are flattering to the rich and scornful to the poor. He encouraged us, each of us, to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. He censures careless religious discourse by those who wish well for the poor or for the marginalized or those that have some need, but do nothing to help them. And then just last week, we saw how James condemns superficial speech or claims of those who, you know, those who claim to have faith, but don't have accompanying deeds. And then after today's passage, a number of other places in the book of James, you have in, in chapter 4, verse 11, you know, he tells us not to judge or slander others. He highlights the arrogance of boasting of one's plans without considering God and how, what's his part in those plans. He tells us not to complain about each other or to grumble. You know, so James is very much concerned with how we use our language, our speech. It's not all negative, um, in, especially at the end of the book, end of the letter. You have some positive, encouraging things that he, James highlights about speech. Um, he talks about an integrity of speech talks about how we use our language to pray to God. And we should pray to God and pray for others and pray for healing. He also highlights how we are to sing songs of praise to God as we've already been doing this morning. Or humming them uh, to ourselves. Um, he also talks about confessing, using our, our our, our mouth, our, our tongue to confess our sins to God so that we may have reconciliation, that we may be forgiven. And then he also talks at the very end about, you know, where we can use our language, use our words to correct someone who's straying. So there's lots of, of, of things where, you know, our speech, our language reveals something about who we are. You know, what are our deepest convictions? You know, it's sort of a barometer for our spiritual health and life. And in this passage that we're talking about today, and this is actually the, you know, really the longest passage talking about language and the tongue that we find in James and, in fact, in the New Testament. And it sort of really highlights the devastating power of the tongue. And so uh, there's an introduction where he highlights and talks about, uh, introduces the passage. Uh, and then he talks about the disproportionate power that the tongue can have in our lives. That it's kind of a small muscle, right? It's a small, I, I, I'm tempted to stick it out. Actually, I thought Joyce was going to take that that whipping cream and just, ah, you know, and, 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 but that wouldn't really relate to the tongue. That'd be maybe talking about, well, it's related to the tongue that you shouldn't speak with your mouth full of whipping cream. Um, but, you know, so it's, he talks about the disproportionate power of the tongue, and then he highlights the destructive potential of the tongue. And that's really where he highlights. It's, it's a rather pessimistic look at, at the significant impact that the tongue can have. And so he starts off uh, with sort of a, a dual focus, right? He's talking, on the one hand, you have this warning to those desiring to be teachers, right? He says, not many of you should become teachers because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Notice the we there. James is including himself, you know, as, as a teacher in the early church. And we knew that, we know that he is, and we're reading one of his letters, for instance, that's teaching that, but he was one of the uh, main teachers in the early church, and he highlights that this is sort of a responsibility that he shouldn't 
you know, that shouldn't be entered into lightly. And, and, I, and this is the verse that <laughs> I'm well aware of, right? And it's something which you think of, uh, you know, and, and, and it is something that I think that if, if you feel called, you know, to teach, you know, in the church, that uh, part of it is that when you, when you feel called towards that, well, what's your main tool of your trade? It's going to be your tongue. And so part of it is that the, just because you're speaking more or you're writing more, you're, you're teaching more, that the likelihood that you're going to slip up or say something that's inappropriate is actually higher. But I think he's highlighting more than just that. He's saying that there is this responsibility that we have, you know, not only to teach correct doctrine, but also correct practice, right? And that, that you have to realize that um, when you're up here speaking, that it's not just your words, but it's also your life that people are evaluating. And that is something that's kind of scary and humbling. So I'll, I'll move on, though, um, because he doesn't stop there. He doesn't say, you know, it's, this isn't just stuff for teachers. Because guess what? You all have tongues. Right? And so there's this sense that, that the problem of the tongue, while it might be something that we have to consider even more if you're going to be a teacher, but it's something that we all have to consider. And when you think about it, um, you know, he says that we all stumble in many ways. And, and the idea there, I think, is that we all stumble in many different ways. We all have our own sins that we struggle with. We all have our own uh, tendencies that we have to continually repent of and, and work on and grow on with God's grace. But one that's common to all of us is the challenge to control the tongue. You know, he highlights there, he says, we stumble in many different ways. And then he almost says with sarcasm, you know, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. You know, we know already from James that he doesn't think that this perfection can be attained in this lifetime. And so it's something that he realized that we all struggle with, with our language, with our speech, with our tongues. And so the, the point really that he is highlighting is that we're all in the same boat with this struggle. And it's something that is sort of like part of the human condition, I think, is to struggle with the language that we use towards other people. And quite frankly, even the language that we use towards ourselves. So he goes on and he highlights a couple examples of the disproportionate power that the tongue has. And he gives the first one of a horse and a bridle, right? And a horse, the, the bit that you put in the horse's mouth. And, and then the fact of the matter, that small bit that you put in the mouth, and it quite frankly it looks rather uncomfortable, right? But that can control you know, where the horse goes. Uh, then he gives another example of the ship in the rudder, right? That here you, you can have a huge ship and you have this small rudder that can serve, and one person can control the movement of the ship. And, and so the, the image that for those here see, that's actually the Galilean sort of type of boat that Jesus and the apostles would have used. And they didn't have the big rudder in the middle, but it would be on the side. And so it's even smaller than when we think of a rudder. And it's even smaller, and yet you can control the movement of a ship. And so he kind of uses that as this point of comparison. And he says, in the same way, the tongue is something that's small, yet can make huge boasts, or as a New Living Translation renders it, you know, grand speeches. And, and it isn't necessarily negative when he talks about like when we think of boasting, most of the time we think of, that, well, it's something negative, but the word that he actually uses here is different than the word that he uses later on for boasting, which is negative and sinful. But it's the idea that the, the tongue, you know, when you think of it, it, great things can come out of your mouth. 
but also horrible things can come out of your mouth. And the point that he's making is that, you know, because it's so small that we have to really control it because it can have huge implications in our lives. And just as the bit in the horse's mouth and the rudder that's controlling the ship, so the tongue can determine the destiny of the individual. And it, that might sound, oh, come on, you're over-exaggerating. Um, and the analogy doesn't quite, you know, it isn't quite like our tongue doesn't control our actions. But I think the point that he's making here is that in the same way that, that the tongue can have a significant impact on your life, and someone who can control your tongue, because it's so crucial, you can probably control other aspects of your life. And someone who can't control their tongue is probably a mess in other aspects of their life as well. Right? So there's this correlation. But he highlights this disproportionate power that the tongue has in our lives. And then he turns and it goes you know, even darker where he talks about the destructive potential. And he compares it to a spark that ignites this huge forest fire. And, and I think that we all understand, you know, how just, you know, driving an ATV or something like that and, and one little spark can have a devastating impact and can, cre- and can have a huge forest fire, not quite putting out your fire, your camping fire, all these sorts of things, throwing out a cigarette butt without making sure it's put out. Like, we understand this idea that a spark you know, can start a huge fire and a huge loss of life. And, and of course, in ancient Palestine, it would have been primarily brush fires, which again can ignite and can spread, you know, horrendously fast. But then he highlights, and it gets even worse again, where he says the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. And this is something that we just need to get, we need to let this sink in. The totally devastating impact that words can have. And while we might sort of think that, well, you know, we just have to learn how to control it better, And we can sort of practice some stuff that, you know, while we, you know, wait 24 hours before we send that email, or we count to 10, and those are all good things, by the way. But it minimizes, I think, the true impact, you know, of the significance of, you know, what really is controlling us sometimes. This verse is challenging, like it actually is one that is, the Greek is difficult, but the point is clear. The tongue has a potential to corrupt the whole person. It has this leavening effect on our lives. No other part of the body can wreak so much havoc for the godly life than the tongue. And this negative power comes straight from hell itself. All this leads James to conclude that, you know, where he highlights that it's impossible to tame the tongue. He says, all kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by humankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, what he's saying in effect is while you may be able to train your dog, we have a lot more trouble training your tongue. And I just like that dog. If I had a dog, I would train it to pick up its own stuff. You know, I notice how I cropped the picture so you didn't have to experience it. Sorry, for you guys living at home, living at home. You all live at home. Those viewing at home, you don't get to see the image. You'll have to go online and look at the slides after. So, um, so, so it is something, you know, that is significant here that James is, is rather pessimistic. 
You know, but no human being can tame the tongue. You know, and the question is then, is there really no hope for us? You know, is there really no hope, you know, that, that we can sort of, you know, train it or, or somehow work on the language that we speak? And I, and I think it's significant here, the, the actual wording of verse 8, um, literally, no one of humans is able to tame the tongue. And a lot of translations don't pick this out. They don't highlight this, which I think is unfortunate. Um, Augustine, already back in the 4th century, highlighted that he's saying that, well, no human can tame the tongue, but it's saying nothing about God. Right? And, and he says that James does not say that no one can tame the tongue, but no one of men. So that when it is tamed, we confess that this is brought about by the pity, the help, the grace of God. And so there is this glimmer of hope that, that James gives here when he highlights that with God all things are possible. That God can help us train our, our tongues. So he goes on, and he doesn't really expand on that hope in this passage. Um, instead, he continues this description. And, and he really here he highlights the problem of a forked tongue. And this is sort of an image that we are maybe uh, aware of. Uh, but it's when we sort of say one thing, but we mean another. Or we do another, right? Or we, talk to, we say something to someone in person, but then we talk about them behind their back. You know, where it's sort of this, it goes back to the double-mindedness that James highlights and condemns in chapter 1, verse 8. And here he says that, you know, the, 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 the worst thing possible is that we can use our tongue to bless God, to sing praises to God, to pray to God, and then we use it to curse people who are made in the likeness of God. That highlights the double-mindedness that we often struggle with. You know, the fourth tongue that we often had, that, that, that on the one hand we can come to church, on Sunday morning, or we can watch church online on Sunday morning, and we can sing these great songs of praise and the hymns, and we can praise God from whom all blessings flow. But then some of the other stuff that flows out of our mouth is horrible. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, James says, this should not be. The fact that one can in the same breath praise God and then curse someone else reveals something of just how contrary to nature it is. It's not the way it should be. And, and what's probably behind this, even that makes it even worse in James' context, right, is that we talked about how earlier that, you know, he, you know James alludes to the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And how they would say that three times a day. They would also, you know, if, if someone was a practicing, devout, Jewish Christian in the first century, that they would also, you know, pray these benedictions or these blessings to God. But then they would go about and, and say other stuff to people. So this is probably what's going on. Is that on the one hand, they're willing to, to pray to God in these doxologies. But then their words are also used to slander to complain, to grumble, to condemn other people. What we say, you know, when, when we say we follow Christ, but then when we use language like this, we betray our true allegiance. You know, when we curse others.
And this isn't just something that we need to work on. You know, let's get a self-help book and, and work on our language. You know, for James, you know, he says it's sin. That it's not just something we need to work on, we need to repent of it. And what you talk about repentance... You know, that means when you, you, you ask for forgiveness from God and from whoever you offended, but then it also includes this idea that we don't keep doing it. And so we have to take this seriously. So, what can we do? You know, and I think especially we have to, in this day and age, we have to extend it, obviously, beyond what we say with our mouths and what we tweet with our thumbs, or at least I do because my, the keyboard's far too small on the phones, or what we type in emails, what we post on a comment board on YouTube, or, or how we, you know, what we post on Facebook. All the social media stuff where we interact with people more often through social media than we ever do in person. And the danger of that is that sometimes it's easier because they're not standing right in front of you. So how can we tame the tongue? Well, God needs to transform the heart first. You know, as, as Joyce said in her kids' feature, that God needs to do a work in our hearts because it's what is inside us. That's what comes out of our mouths. So for James, only a renewed heart can produce right speech. And consistently, though not perfectly, Right? So, you know, we, I don't think we can attain this perfection in this life. We will all slip up. We will all say things we shouldn't. But hopefully, prayerfully, we can reduce the amount that we do, when we, when, that we sin when we speak. Right? That consistently pure speech is a product of a renewed heart. It's the product of God's working in our lives. As well as just using some, you know, I guess it's not really common sense, but because if it was common, it wouldn't be an issue, right? But, it's, it's, but using some strategies that we can work with God and we can sort of clean up our language and, and, and just, you know, make sure that what comes out of our mouth is something that glorifies God. And it should be something that we can grow in in our lives, We need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to rely on God to control our tongues. You know, in, in Psalm 141, verse 3, the psalmist prays, O Lord, set a guard over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. And that should be a prayer that we pray to ourselves Whenever we're going to say something that we kind of think that, well, do you, should we say it? If you ever get that, if, if God ever works in, in you and you get that little voice in your head saying, oh, gee, should I say it? Don't say it. At least not right then. Get someone else to, you know, talk to someone. Let it go for a day. You know, think about it. Have someone proofread the email. Because that's God. I'm convinced that that little voice in your head that's saying, oh, gee, you know, is it too harsh? Should I say that? Is that, you know, that's probably God through the Holy Spirit convicting you. So, three things. Learn to listen. Right? If we're talking, you know, then that means that you know, you're not listening. So we need to learn to listen well. All of us are bad at this. And some are better than others. And God bless you. 
right? Like, so, you know, like we shouldn't be formulating what we're going to respond to someone, you know, and not listening to them. But we need to have active listening. We need to really, you know, we need to look them in the eye. We need to really listen to what they're saying. Knowing the potential damage that our speech can inflict on others should be enough reason to give us pause before we say a harsh word or uncalled for comment. You know, in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27, one who uses words with restraint is knowledgeable. One who is even-tempered has understanding. Right? You know, so again, see that connection between our words and, and our anger. I like verse 28 because he says, you know, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent. <laughs> Just think someone might actually, you know, if you're, if you're silent, if you don't speak out whatever you're thinking, whatever sort of verbal diarrhea is going on in your head, if you actually are silent, then someone might think you're wise. And discerning if they hold their tongues. And of course, James, you know, says that everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. But he doesn't just stop there. He also says slow to anger. For your anger doesn't produce God's righteousness. Right? And I get that there's sometimes there's righteous anger that we can talk about. There's things that we should... Uh, you know, the, the, the things that anger God should also anger us in some ways. But I don't think that's really what James is talking about here. He's talking about the, the, the anger that, that wells up in us and, and just kind of comes out and we fly off the handle. But that sort of anger, you know, does not, you know, please God. And if we have a problem with that, we need to deal with it. So taking the 24-hour rule, counting to 10, walking away. You know, in the marriage counseling course that, that Les and Cheryl are talking about, you know, like it asks you the question, do you really want to throw gasoline on, on the fire? You know, or something that actually will be good? And we'll put out the fire rather than increase it. It only takes a spark. We should seek to be positive in our language. You know, there's lots of verses that talk about this. Um, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You know, throughout uh, in Colossians, let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In Ephesians 4, a number of places, it says there, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only that what is useful for building up, as there is, no, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. How often does, do your words give grace? In verse 25, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor for all members of one body. So again, the, the, the truthful, and not this blunt truth. Like sometimes we, you know, well, I'm only speaking the truth. No, you're being hateful when you're speaking that truth. You're being ungracious and unkind. Right? So it's truth and grace. It's truth with love. And in verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. So there is a place for rebuke, for correction. Right? And the scriptures talk about that. And the Proverbs and wisdom literature highlights that, that we should be eager to, to hear rebuke. And that, that's a mark of being truly a wise person. But we need to do it carefully. And if we are, you know, if you need to criticize, you know, we should keep in the back of our minds, like uh, in James 4.12, you know, who are you to judge your neighbor? 
That's kind of God's job. So you need to evaluate, what's your job description here? Is this your job to correct this person? If you're not in a relationship with them, then it probably isn't. Right? And you let God deal with it, and you treat them as grace, and you love them, because that's what we're called to do. Um, but there's times and, and where you do have to cre- you know, criticize and evaluate people, and, and that's, it should be full of grace and full of truth. So I want to encourage this, because sometimes it's, it's in our closest relationships that we can be the harshest. And so I really, you know, even if you're not married, you know, yet, you know, if you're in a relationship, you know, this sort of stuff can be good. Because it talks about, like these sessions talk about how to, how to communicate, how to fight well without it going and, and going down that place where you don't want it to go. And then finally, we should strive for integrity in our speech. This is something that comes up, you know, throughout James in terms of our actions as well as our language, right? That we should, you know, do what we say and we should say what we do. Why? Well, because that's how God works. And so, this morning we're celebrating communion. And so it's appropriate as we come to the Lord's table, as we come to the bread and to the wine, when we remember what, that Jesus died on the cross for our benefit so that we may have reconciliation with God. We may be forgiven our sins of speech with God as well as all of our other sins. But it doesn't end there because that reconciliation then also should spread out and it should be reconciliation with one another, with others who are created in the image of God. And so as we come to communion, we're going to, I have a prayer of of repentance that I'm going to encourage all of us here to say. And if you can't pray it, right, if it isn't coming from your heart, then don't. You're wearing a mask. No one will know any different. Right? Don't. Like, this is something that I think is important. Let's have integrity when we ask forgiveness, when we repent. And then as we, when we leave here later today, you know, through the, the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, let's try to be different and try to be better. So hopefully, um, when you came in, you should have received one of these communion packages. If you didn't, uh, you can put up your hand and and the usher can make sure you get one. And um, so now, uh, Kim and and Matt can come up and prepare. They're going to, after we pray this prayer of repentance, we're going to have a time of silent reflection. And so I pray that you just will reflect you know, on this prayer of confession, and you'd reflect on, you know, well, how have you been using language, maybe in a way that you shouldn't, and then ask God to to change you. And and don't worry about other people. You're only responsible for yourself. And then Murray will come up, and we'll pray for the cup. We're going to take the cup and the, the bread at the same time. Um, and he'll pray for it. So anyways, let's uh, pray this prayer of repentance. We all stumble in many ways, Lord, especially with our words. We are truly sorry for words spoken without thinking or in anger or in gossip Forgive us the many thoughtless or harsh words that we have spoken. Holy Spirit, transform our hearts and our tongues. Help us be slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to anger. 
Help us to be people full of gentle and kind words, full of your spirit, overflowing with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, we cannot control our tongues by ourselves. We need your help. And Lord, we, we pray this prayer and we ask for your help today. In Jesus' name.